so hopefully there's some people there that I'm, uh, I'm speaking to. Um, my name is Rob Hughes. Um, I'm a research associate in the uh, Department of Physics and in the School of um, Engineering as well, Mechanical Engineering. Um, and I've been doing a, an AMR project um, through Bristol Bridge on uh, bacterial manipulation or magnetic particle manipulation for bacterial manipulation. Um, so today I'm going to talk you through um, essentially the kind of the background and some of the, the kind of um, current trends in uh, magnetic uh, applications really and things that you can use magnetism for within a sort of um, biological or diagnosis sort of uh, environment, uh, particularly for uh, AMR purposes. So I'm going to attempt to share things with you now. Perfect. Okay. Um, so as I said, um, magnetic applications in AMR testing. Um, and I'm going to concentrate on some uh, stuff that's vaguely related to, to what I'm doing. So lab on a chip uh, bacteria separation um, and some interesting sort of uh, developments that have, that have occurred and some of the kind of nice little tricks that people have been trying um, in the literature. So I'll give you some background as to why we might be trying to, uh, in the first place, do anything with, uh, with magnetic particles and bacteria simultaneously um, in a microfluidic or a lab on a chip type environment. Um, so the basic sort of uh, problem that you're faced with is any real world source of uh, bacteria or anything like that, any blood sample, water sample like that, is going to have uh, many foreign bodies, potentially many bacteria, many cells within it. So you're going to need to somehow separate out the bacteria that you want to test uh, in order to uh, concentrate it and determine what the um, whether it's resistant to certain antibiotics and things like that. Um, so this is a kind of demonstrated in this very um, advanced model that I've uh, developed, uh, whereby you are separating out the, uh, the bacteria that you need in some form and concentrating it into a smaller volume. Um, this can take sort of um, hours to days in the lab and clinics, um, sort of developing, you know, concentrating down in centrifuges and stuff like that. So if you can do this in a sort of um, in situ lab on a chip type environment, then that's, that's a very valuable uh, technique to have. These are an example of the, uh, the types of bacteria that you'd be looking at. So this is E. coli, um, and these little arrows are pointing at the flagella. Flagella, I never remember exactly how to pronounce that. Um, and uh, there's obviously different strains of, of E. coli, and some of them are resistant to certain antibiotics. So being able to test which antibiotics to give um, is extremely valuable. This is taken from um, Sarah Carreria's uh, PhD. So the, the main sort of starting point or nexus really for this, this work or the stuff that I'm interested in is the magnetic labeling. So that's where really you, you begin to start being able to use uh, magnetic methods um, for your kind of sensing and um, manipulation. Um, and really that comes about because of the uh, negative surface charge of uh, these cell walls for the bacteria. You're able to functionalize the surface of some mag magnetic nanoparticles um, using this uh, positive amine uh, group here, for example. Um, and then these readily attach to the, the surface of the bacteria. And so then you're covering it in lots of these tiny little magnetic balls. So these are super paramagnetic balls that are approximately kind of 10 millimeters, sorry, nanometers inside. Um, and uh, they have a very sort of um, magnetizable um, characteristics. So uh, the stuff that I was using with uh, Sarah and for this this work was um, cationized magnetoferritin. So that's developed through a protein which you find out of the spleen of a horse, which is very uh, you can then label, as I said, the surface of these um, bacteria with the magnetic nanoparticles. Um, and as you can see here, the differences between a labeled and an unlabeled um, E. coli. Um, and I've given you a sort of uh, diagrammatic version, so this little circle labeled with the black thing, so that any future slides where you see that, you'll know that it's a labeled bacteria as opposed to, to unlabeled. Um, so what uh, Sarah did in her, her work, in her PhD, was she demonstrated that you could use this magnetic labeling on uh, E. coli. 
um, and you could put them through these test tubes that had um, little iron balls, or effectively little iron balls uh, within them, put that within a magnetic field, um, and then the uh, solution that came out the bottom uh, was free of the magnetically labeled bacteria um, as they'd been attached to the um, uh, to the magnet magnetized sort of iron balls that were within this uh, within this test tube. Then, when you remove it from the uh, magnetic field, you're then able to push through um, a small amount of solution to free up the bacteria from the balls, um, and then you have concentrated um, and a kind of high um, retention efficiency for these bacteria. Um, so I think she demonstrated that you can do up to about 99% of the, of the bacteria from the solution, which is um, exactly the kind of um, method that you want really in order to, to concentrate down your bacteria. And then obviously you can start doing the tests on them to determine whether they're resistant to certain antibiotics. So um, I'm now going to talk a little bit about magnetism and uh, some of the kind of principles behind it. I don't mean to insult anyone's intelligence. I'm sure this is all very sort of uh, GCSE level, um, but I wanted to start from a, a kind of a clear base point. Um, so magnets, um, basic mar bar magnets everyone will, will be fully aware of. Um, they um, have a north and a south pole, um, and you can demonstrate the magnetic field lines that you uh, can see using iron filings, which is what you can see on the, on the right-hand side here. Um, and Magnetic particles or magnetizable particles um, will be attracted towards high magnetic field and high magnetic field or flux density. Um, so that's pretty much the points where at the north and south poles, uh, where they all kind of come together into a, a smaller area. Um, and this is an important factor to kind of um, be aware of and to to try and maximize and optimize when you're coming to to manipulation or or um, or capture and things like that. So one of the other types of magnetism that you might, I'm sure you're all aware of, um, is uh, electromagnetism. So the basic principle that if you pass a current through um, a wire, uh, then you generate a magnetic field around the wire. Um, and you can then use this to generate electromagnets um, by putting many turns around um, a core, so a, a magnetizable core like a nail on the right there, and then you're able to use that as a, a sort of simple um, electromagnet. These are very sort of versatile, or this allows a kind of a certain versatility uh, into uh, the magnetic field uh, that you generate within an environment. Um, so these are potentially a very powerful um, mechanism for generating magnetic fields. Um, and just to give you a couple of examples of the types that uh, you know you see in everyday life and where this, uh, where sort of bacterial manipulation sits within that, um, the Earth's magnetic field is. Um, Micro Tesla, so very, very small, but that can still turn the needle on a, on a compass. Um, and you have fridge magnets, the you know, few milli Tesla, rare earth magnets that normally go up to about half a Tesla, sometimes a Tesla um, if they're particularly large. Um, you have uh, speaker electromagnets that go up to a Tesla within the kind of uh, the speaker gap. Uh, MRI magnets, and then going on to even grander, bigger things like the Large Hadron Collider um, and uh, the magnets that they used to, to levitate a frog, which was up to 16 Tesla. We won't be going any, anywhere near that. Um, we will be using uh, a few hundred milli Tesla, that sort of magnitude. So rare earth magnets are, are good, and also you can develop electromagnets that will uh, achieve the same sorts of um, magnetism. Um, uh, the other thing that's important to know um, is about uh, super paramagnetic behavior. Um, so everyone will be aware, really, of, or should hopefully be aware of um, the thing called the uh, hysteresis loop, magnetic hysteresis loop, um, which is on the left there. Um, so that demonstrates that in order to magnetize uh, a lump of metal, for example, um, there requires a sort of threshold for the domains within that um, metal will all align into the same uh, orientation. Once they're all aligned, you get magnetic saturation. Um, and then there's a certain uh, magnetic field or negative magnetic field that you have to apply in order to get them all to flip back um, and go to a negative direction. Um, and all align again, and then all saturate again, things like that. And it's this kind of um, lag, magnetic uh, lag, um, that determines their sort of how ferromagnetic they are. 
how, how able they are to kind of support a, a magnetic field or retain a magnetic field. Um, super paramagnetic particles um, sort of only really exist uh, on the very small scale. So uh, you can have a, a, a micro particle that still has a number of domains. And in having a number of domains, it then means that it has to um, orientate each of those domains into, into the kind of uh, magnetic axis. Um, so it will have a certain amount of um, coercivity, which is this um, you know, being able to coerce your, uh, your particle into, into being the direction you want. Whereas when you reduce it down in size, uh, you can develop single domain particles, um, which are then able to change the magnetic field very, very quickly in reaction to an external applied magnetic field. And therefore, you have uh, negligible, very small uh, coercivity, and so they can be magnetized and demagnetized. Um, for uh, fantastically fast. So uh, that's what the sort of inlet here on the left, top left, is uh, demonstrating there. Um, so we have, we are using kind of magnetic nanoparticles that are sub 30 nanometers. Um, and they're sort of made of this uh, iron three oxide um, or magnetite. The basic um, sort of theory behind trapping or manipulating or um, whatever you want to do with your magnetic field and your magnetic nanoparticle comes down to a force balance. Um, so the force that a magnet will apply to a magnetic nanoparticle is dependent on the uh, magnetic uh, flux density strength and the gradient of the magnetic flux density, which is what I was talking about before, about the fact that magnetic particles or magnetizable particles um, want to go to the highest density um, region of, of flux. Um, and obviously it's dependent on how uh, susceptible to a magnetic field uh, a particle is, so how, uh, what kind of material it's made from, and its volume and things like that. And then if you're trying to use them within some sort of microfluidic device, or if you're flying them past, then you want to be able to know that your magnetic force is going to overcome any sort of drag force that is exhibited by the, uh, the fluid going through the, uh, the material, so that's dependent on viscosity and speed. So let's move on to uh, lab lab on a chip, um, and particular sort of magnetic particles, um, and how we can use them within the, the lab on a chip environment. Um, so microfluidics has um, uh, been a fascinating sort of um, area of research in the past, I'm not entirely sure actually how many years it's been, been around now, maybe five, 10, um, might even be much longer. Um, but there's a lot of promise um, within uh, the research field, and there's a lot of people working on it, even at this use of university. Um, and so being able to do a sort of diagnosis um, uh, tests for AMR or whatever uh, on these devices without having to run between different labs and concentrate and things like that is very, very valuable. Uh, so the basic, uh, or the starting point, if you like, um, for magnetic methods within microfluidics is magnetic capture, which essentially is the same principle as the uh, max columns which Sarah used, where you uh, essentially just magnetize an area, pass your fluid with your magnetically labeled particles uh, across it, and then when you take it out, you'll have you'll be left with your magnetic particles or your or your labeled bacteria. Um, so this is something that people uh, have done quite readily. They they use many different techniques. Um, this one here is I think passing uh, I think it was blood cells actually in this one uh, through a basic Holbach array. Uh, whereby you have regions of, of very high magnetic field strength in the gaps between those two, uh, between those three magnets there. Um, and you get very good um, capture. Like I said before, you have to try and enhance the magnetic flux density so that you get the uh, particles, um, you retain the particles and the flow uh, within your microfluidic device doesn't uh, dislodge them. Um, and also that you're able to retain as many as possible because um, obviously you want a high efficiency. The problem with this, uh, as well as that magnetic field strength dies off with distance um, quite quite dramatically, so one over R cubed from the poles, um, which isn't great if you're um, wanting to use it over a large distance, but for microfluidics this, this is a very sort of suitable range. Um, so, uh, Again, the, the next step after you've kind of initially trapped your, uh, your bacteria just using kind of bulk magnets uh, would be to then start using some, some more interesting um, designs. 
So something which uh, another research group has done uh, is using small um, soft magnetic, so things that are magnetizable easily uh, and demagnetized when you turn off the magnetic field around them, um, and having pillars of them throughout a microfluidic device um, so that you maximize the kind of um, magnetic surface area, really, that uh, bacteria come across. Um, so your retention should hopefully be a lot higher. Um, and this is some of the, the data that they've chosen, or some pictures anyway. So you have the, these soft magnetic pillars before they've been magnetized. You have them when the magnetic field has been applied in the bacteria, or I think in this case it was just the uh, magnetic nanoparticles, um, have been passed across, and you have this kind of clumping uh, at, the, at the poles or the pillars. Um, and then when you turn off the magnetic field, uh, you get this dispersion of the magnetic nanoparticles, um, and you can flush through and recollect the, um, the solution. Uh, equally, uh, going on to electromagnetic sort of uh, manipulation or uh, capturing, you can do a similar sort of uh, trapping in particular locations using um, uh, sort of fabricated um, printed circuit board type uh, electromagnets. Uh, so there's a group. Not entirely sure they were all based in um, specific design um, or scientific kind of uh, premises, but uh, they demonstrated that you could trap um, nanoparticles. Uh, in this case, it was actually much larger nanoparticles, um, so I think they were in the micron scale uh, as opposed to nanometer. Um, and I can I can say from personal experience that using this approach for nanometer uh, nanoparticles doesn't work. Um, just due to the, the size of the particles and not large enough uh, for the, the quite weak magnetic forces that are, um, come about due to the, the electromagnet uh, from printed circuitry. However, that doesn't mean that they don't have their place, particularly when you've covered a bacteria with a lot of um, nanoparticles, that changes its effective um, magnetizability or its effective kind of interaction with magnetic fields. So uh, that was that was capture, magnetic capture. Um, the other thing that's a little bit more interesting and slightly more versatile uh, is magnetic sorting. So uh, there's a researcher um, named Pam, uh, I can't remember her first name, um, who's done a number of really nice uh, reviews on magnetic sorting um, and looking at the kind of different, different ways people are doing it. Um, and some of the work that she's done uh, is looking at sorting different bacteria dependent on the interaction with uh, the magnetic nanoparticles. So you may have some bacteria that are a different size or shape, uh, which therefore don't have as many nanoparticles associated to its surface, um, compared to uh, bacteria that are very strongly attached to lots of magnetic nanoparticles. And so there, uh, the deflection uh, within a magnetic field uh, will therefore be different for each one. So she's demonstrated that you can actually separate them out uh, within a, a deflection chamber um, uh, having numerous kind of outlets uh, by having this kind of uh, configuration here. Uh, there's equally uh, people working on uh, not just using sort of strong rare earth, uh, sorry, uh, rare earth magnets, um, but, but trying to improve the, um, the rate of change, the gradient of the magnetic flux within a particular region. So as you remember from the equation, um, it is dependent, or your, your magnetic force is dependent on both the strength and the, uh, the gradient of your magnetic flux. So if it's going from a low to a very high magnetic flux density over a short range, then you get a very strong force. Um, so people have tried to kind of uh, manipulate and optimize this sort of design, and they've done that through a number of different ways. Um, some of the more sort of promising ones have used uh, this sort of nano or micro fabricated um, uh, spike sort of um, configuration, whereby at each of the tips of those spikes, uh, you have a very high flux density. Um, and so you kind of have this periodic uh, variation in your magnetic field across the, across the channel. Uh, and as you ramp up towards a, a high uh, magnetic flux, you get a stronger pull on your on your nanoparticle than you do um, just with a standard permanent magnet uh, mucking around. Uh, equally, some people have played around with some um, slightly more difficult uh, configurations whereby they have strips of um, uh, 
uh, of magnetizable material, so similar to kind of uh, this ferrite. Uh, and by angling them at certain uh, orientations and having specific magnetic fields uh, associated with them, they're able to sort out different size uh, magnetic nanoparticles. Um, so you can you see on the on the right there, you get a sort of separation of about three different particles from, from solution. Um, these are all very um, particle and solution specific, so they need to know exactly the size of the, the particles and um, and the makeup of the of the solution that you're uh, that you're interested in, in order to actually um, effectively uh, pull out these particles, which is not you know not a bad thing at all. But it would be great if we could start developing towards um, adaptable sorts of manipulation, which is then you'd have to move away from physical um, constructions. So um, you know, certain angles and, and orientations of these of these strips. Uh, one of the other more um, promising ones as well is using uh, electromagnetic traps and um, essentially passing uh, particles between these traps. Um, so there's a group that was working on um, trapping magnetic nanoparticles again um, within these uh, printed circuit board. Um, coils, uh, and then alternating uh, these traps that were next to each other, and able to like slowly manipulate these particles towards uh, a particular outlet, um, which was a nice little design. It requires a lot more sort of uh, complicated electronics, but with the kind of uh, scalable, scalability of electronics, um, then uh, this is much more kind of achievable in the, in the future. So I also wanted to, to talk kind of briefly, um, uh, just before I finish, actually, about some other really quite interesting and fun, slightly more outlandish um, ideas, um, which you could use kind of magnetic methods for. So one of them is uh, having a uh, magnetic pump, uh, which I thought was a really interesting uh, concept, um, whereby you have a, a, a loop, a microfluidic loop, and you have a um, ferrofluid within it. And you have a magnet that's preventing, uh, the, sorry, a magnet that's trapping some ferrofluid between the two, the inlet and the outlet, so that you can't get flow through one direction. Uh, that would be anti-clockwise. Um, and then you have a second magnet that is rotated. This could be done with uh, an array of electromagnets as well, turning on just like a motor, um, to manipulate a second sort of um, lump of, uh, of ferrofluid um, around the loop, thereby pumping fluid uh, from inlet to outlet. Um, I can't remember exactly the efficiency of this, but if anyone is interested, I can I can send them the paper. Um, equally, there's um, some really interesting papers. Uh, this uh, the middle picture here is just one uh, to do with uh, mixing of your um, particles. So, uh, in order to make this an entirely potentially integrated system on a, on a lab on a chip, uh, you could have your inlet solution entirely untampered with. Um, probably tampered with slightly, let's be honest. Um, and then you can have your magnetic nanoparticles um, into a different outlet, and then you can mix them all up in the same sort of region. Um, this one in the middle, um, I thought was a really nice little idea. It was a, a nano or micro na uh, fabricated uh, perma alloy stirrer that they then just put the whole thing onto a standard lab bench stirrer. Um, and that performed the, the, the kind of stirring and mixing um, for, the, for the system. Um, and equally, there's sort of other rotational magnet um, sorts of uh, applications where they can pull uh, magnetic labeled bacteria through different solutions, be it washer um, or be it a labeling solution, um, and then pulling it out into to that kind of final uh, state. So you can kind of put it through many processes in a single uh, system. Um, so um, hopefully, I have uh, I have demonstrated. Uh, roughly on time, um, that you are able to do magnetic labeling of bacteria, um, which allows this magnetic actuation. Um, and this can be used for many different applications. Um, and there's a great kind of promise in this area for, for kind of lab on a chip um, diagnosis uh, system. So, anyway, I hope you've enjoyed. Thank you very much.